The Dice Tower is made possible by listeners like you. Thank you for your support. And by Cool Stuff, Inc. Cool Stuff, in stock at CoolStuffInc.com. The Dice Tower, Episode 601. Hilarious Games. Welcome to the Dice Tower, a podcast about board games and card games, and especially the people who play them. On today's show, Gary Pope joins us in the third chair. Jeff combines one of my favorite game shows with one of my favorite video games. We answer questions about game labeling, desert island scenarios, and the psychology of semi-co-op games, and get downright silly with our top ten hilarious games. I'm Eric Summerer, and here's your host, the Ross to my Chandler, Tom Vassell. Uh, no. No one likes Ross. Uh, but everyone likes Chandler. Yes, I know. Uh, well, that would make Gary uh, Joey, then. Sure. Welcome to the show, Gary Pope. <laughs> hey, what's up, guys? Long time no talk. Howdy. Well, apparently, you're Joey, I guess, in this scenario. He could be Joey. He's the one that gets uh, a spinoff. Eh. Uh, yes, and how well did that do? I remember it going really well. <laughs> uh, nice memory. It's always, it's always fascinating to me how well that show has done worldwide. When I was in Korea, there you, you could buy the whole series of friends to learn English. Hmm. I've, Wait, what? Really? Like it was like a training thing? Yeah. Oh. I don't, I don't know if that's good. You know, you meet a Korean, they're like, how are you doing? I'm like, um... <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, that's not the first time I've heard of that concept. I've heard many, many people outside the United States have learned English through friends. It's, it, for some reason, the show is extremely popular overseas. Huh. Really? I've actually never watched the show. I've watched a couple episodes. That's at most, maybe. I don't know why. Uh, 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 uh. I'm afraid to say anything one way or the other, actually, with the, our, our audience. I, f- I feel like I'll offend somebody. Um... <laughs> Well, folks, welcome to the Dice Tower. We're glad that you're with us. I'm Tom Vassell, in case you missed that part. And uh, I'm Eric Summerer. You you heard me say that earlier. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Well, before we get into gaming, we have a couple things. First of all, Dice Tower Cruise Registration opened last Friday. I don't know if it's sold out. The rooms were selling at a breakneck pace, and it's not even... Yeah, it, it's... Well, maybe they're not sold out. If so, go check it out. But if they are sold out, Dice Tower Retreat is there. And Eric can vouch for the fact that Dice Tower Retreat is, like, just hardcore gaming to the max. To the max, indeed. But you know what? Both those things are so far in the future. If you want a game, like, even earlier than that, Dice Tower Con is just around the corner in July. So you can get those tickets even easier. And you can see fireworks and Mickey Mouse. Possibly at the same time. Actually, I did that the last time. You saw Mickey Mouse and fireworks and played games at the same time? Okay, at not at the same time, but within the same day. Definitely. Okay. <laughs> was it were you able to move? Um, it actually wasn't that bad out there. Uh we actually got down there and uh we went to Magical Kingdom and we went through all of the main rides and we're out of there. We saw fireworks at the end of the day and then um yeah, went back to Dice Tower Con, started playing the games till midnight or so. Wow. It's a it's a really good combo. I really like that whole, hey, you can go to like this cool things and then go play games that that combo i mean that's why the, i like the cruise too it's that same concept it's fun stuff and games yeah yeah yep. Re- <laughs> retreat is just games so it depends what you're looking for <laughs> unless somebody shows up in a costume i just want to send out a big uh <laughs> thank you to everyone who participated in the jack bass memorial fund auction which should be over at this point in time but it did extremely well, and people put up some really amazing things. So, huzzah for that. Huzzah, indeed. Oh, well, we are, I gotta say, guys, this has been March, maybe just because I'm, a, I'm on the edge of, you know, new games that come out a lot. But, wow, I'm, I'm missing the hot Essen, hot Gen Con, hot Christmas games. There's the <laughs> March doldrums that are around. Now, there's you know there's good games here and there, but I feel like I'm wandering through the desert looking for them. 
<laughs> I think I kind of agree, and and uh, you know I don't see nearly as much as you do, Tom. So uh, I'm I'm feeling the drought for sure. And I'd have to agree too as well. The only exception to this is that I just got one of my Kickstarters in that I ordered like a year ago, uh, Heroes of Land, Air, and Sea. Mm. I know you guys have had that game forever, but I just now got it myself. But um, besides that, yeah, it's been a ghost town kind of. Well, why don't you tell us about this game? Yeah, uh, Heroes of Land, Air, and Sea. If you've never heard of it, it's a uh, 4X game that somehow is condensed to like roughly two to three hours um and it's it's fantastic because uh there's a ton of races in the game so there's a whole bunch of variety of ways to play the game um and you basically you could play the game almost however you want you could be the kind of a a player that's super aggressive that's attacking other people all the time you could kind of turtle up on your own little island and just collect resources and build your own empire and um it's just uh it's one of those games that just uh keeps giving the more times you play because you can understand all the different races in the game and all the different mechanics and all the different ways they play um but it does have a big butt on it um it's definitely one of those games and i've actually sat down and whenever people have started to play the game with me i give them this warning i would say if this is a game in which you have only interest in playing it one time and walking away not a great game but if you're going to play repeated amount of times it's a game that keeps on giving but um but yeah it's uh i've been having a ton of fun with it i've had it for about a week and a half now and i think i played it like at least five six times or something like that hmm. at this point now so you got everything including the new expansion I got everything. I got everything, even the uh, the heroes and the um, the uh, uh, what's called the uh, the expansion characters and stuff like that. They're all painted and everything. I got everything. <laughs> so, what's your favorite faction? Uh, so far, that's a really good question. I'm not sure. I want to say maybe so far it might be the goblins, maybe, but I'm still not sure. There's just so many, and they're just so crazy uh, different. Yeah, I haven't played the newest stuff yet. So from the original one, I really like the lions, or whatever they're called, and the undead. But I'm a big fan of undead in general, except movies. <laughs> That's one of the ones I need to play. They're, they're by far the probably the more complicated ones, um, but they are definitely one of the more interesting ones, because it's just like they just grow their army from fighting people. It's uh, pretty uh, uh, thematic. <laughs> so how many factions are in the game now that you have the expansion and the original box? Um, I think, uh, well, it's two expansions. I think it's, uh, ten factions, if I'm not mistaken. I, cor- please correct me if I'm wrong on this. I, I believe there's, like, ten. Ten sounds correct. <laughs> oh, great. I didn't know I was being, uh, uh, on a game show right now all of a sudden. <laughs> <laughs> So what about you, Eric? What have you been playing? Oh, uh, well, I've, I've gotten to get to some games that have been in the backlog for a little while. This is, this is one that I got introduced to at Essen uh, called Tricky Dungeon. It's from a publisher called Pumpkin Games, which I had not heard of before, and the designer is Arjan van Houwellingen. He's Dutch. Uh, it's it's a trick-taking card game uh, with with a fantasy theme on it. Each round of the game, in fact, each each play session, you're going to choose a set of five rolls. There's three different sets in the box. So there's the A set, the B set, the C set. You'll pick one of those and those will be your rolls for the game. And each of these rolls, these, these characters, has some way of scoring points for each round of the game. You're going to go around the table twice in the in the course of a game, and each time it's your turn to be the, the, the dealer, you will get to choose one of these rolls after you see your initial hand of cards. You'll choose one of these rolls that determines how you're going to score points or try to score points, and the other players are going to try and prevent you from scoring points. Uh, the deck is made up of four suits uh, numbered 0 to 7, and some of those cards have symbols on them, like magic wands and potions. So some of the rolls will say you get points for every potion you manage to acquire throughout the course of the, of the game. Uh, or maybe the magic wands. Or uh, sometimes you start with a whole bunch of points and you lose points for every trick you take. There's even one, the assassin, that uh, you need to take the last trick of the hand. And, and how you do that is possibly tricky, because you have to sort of control the game enough so that you have the killing blow uh-huh. at the end. Um, and, and you continue around the table like this. Oh, there's also, once you uh, have chosen your role, you can, uh, there's always a few cards that don't get dealt out in a game or in a hand. And so the, uh, the leader gets to trade out some of their cards to try and 
build their hand toward whatever the scoring regime is this time. Sometimes there's a Trump suit, sometimes there's not. Uh, so the rules are constantly changing in this game. I do appreciate the the puzzle of trying to make your hand work. You know, if, I, if I'm in charge this round, which which of these scoring you know, regimes is going to score points from you or give me the best chance of scoring points. How do I make this hand work? Or do I, if I have such a terrible hand for this particular scoring rule, maybe if I get rid of four cards and draw new ones, those new ones will fit the scoring rule better. But you, you have to make that decision first before you trade out cards. If, however, you're, you have a really bad hand when it's your turn to earn points, your best opportunity to earn points is when you have the lead, when you, you start it out and you're in control. Uh, the other players that are fighting against you, they, they can score one point if they stop you from scoring whatever the threshold is. If I don't score the four points I need to, to, to win this round, um, then, then everybody else scores one. So if you have a really bad round when it's your turn to be in charge, that can hurt a lot because you're only going to get two times to be in charge and then the game's over. Um, so that can be a little punishing, but it's still a pretty quick game. Um, and, and I think the, the challenge is worth the play there um, and, and any possibility of having a bad hand or two. Still, I, I liked it. Tricky Dungeon. Cool. Hmm. Hmm, hmm, hmm. I don't know. Trick-taking games, there's a lot of them. Yeah, I was going to say, is it worth hunting down? Like, trick-taking games are literally one of my favorite uh, uh, types of games. Is it worth hunting down, would you say? I, I mean, if, if you really like trick-taking games, it, it it is not... I'm not jumping for joy over it, but I, I do think it offers an interesting twist. And that constantly changing uh, set of roles... And it, you play it again, you have a totally different set of five to work with um, that get progressively more difficult. They, they suggest you start with one particular set, but then you're, you're off to the races. You can even combine them all and, and do an even random dungeon and draw a scoring regime each round. Um, so I, I think that rotating system is worth, is worth checking out if you're a fan of trick-taking games. Oh, okay. I felt like a non-answer, but all right. <laughs> Okay, so let's talk about a game. This game was on Kickstarter maybe a year ago, and it's called Zoo Break. It's from a company called Sunday Club Games. And Zoo Break is a game that definitely looks like it's geared towards kids. It's a zoo, and you're all zookeepers of the zoo. There are pandas and tigers and elephants and oh monkeys and snakes. No, no. <laughs> And meerkats and rhinos. Sometimes it's okay to let the easy, low-hanging fruit joke go by. Oh, my. <laughs> anyway, the, all these animals are escaping. And it's your job to keep them from getting out of the zoo. So each turn, you're running your guy around the zoo. You stop at the supply to grab nets and tranquilizer darts and things. And you go and try to put these animals back in their cages. But when your turn's over, you'll turn over two cards, an escape card. Someone will get out of a cage. And a move card, some of the animals will move and they all start running towards the exit. You need to get them back in the cage, and then eventually, once all the animals of a certain type are in a cage, find the key to that cage and lock it. You will lose if five harmless animals escape the zoo. That's meerkats, monkeys, garter snakes, and apparently pandas. I'm not sure, but I guess pandas are just too cute to hurt anybody. You also lose the game if one fierce animal gets out of the zoo, like a tiger, an elephant, or a rattlesnake. Uh. There's a bunch of snakes. The problem is, as the snakes are escaping, they're tokens, so when you find them, you flip them over to see what kind of snake it is. Oh. Sometimes it's a rattlesnake. You can get bitten and have to go to the infirmary. There's also a rhino. The rhino doesn't even try to escape. It just runs around making people lose turns. Uh, if it hits you. Okay. I... I don't know that I expected... I, when I first saw it, I was really wanting to like the game because it had these animal meatballs, you know, looked really cool. Then when I went over to rules, I was like, I don't know, because the main mechanism of the game, when it's your turn, you roll an action die, that's how many actions you get, which I believe is something I say I hate. However, this is mitigated because, one, the die gives you between five and ten actions. Okay, okay. So that's not so bad. Two, it's a cooperative game, so if I only get five actions... That's everybody getting five actions, not just me. Mm -hmm. 
And three, like one of the each person has their own special powers. One of the guy's special powers is he can re-roll the die twice. Apparently, he's a track runner who's helping out in the zoo. Whatever. <laughs> the other disadvantage about the game is that, that, that you have you have to go to the supply shed to get stuff. So everyone goes there on their first turn to grab some equipment. I, I don't know. I just would have dealt everyone some equipment. You know, it just seems like it's a obvious move. But the game is obviously build towards kids i think anyway families maybe it's like a lighter pandemic uh the animals are going and are running trying to get out of the zoo you can modify how difficult it is and such and it's cute and i really liked it i thought it was a lot of fun i love the theme of catching animals and sticking them back in their cages and it just has a really good look to it so that is zoo break cool that's two words by the way okay so gary have you played anything other than heroes of land air and sea or have you been totally focused on that one for the past like two weeks, literally 100% focused on Heroes of Land Air and Sea. I wish I could say I've been playing other things, but that's just not been the case. I mean, I, I played other, I guess you could say, party style games of anything, but those are always on a rotation. But nothing new besides Heroes of Land Air and Sea. The hmm. um, funny thing is that over the next two days, I actually was getting ready to start playing a bunch of different games. I believe tomorrow I might be playing. Um, Oh, I'm having a brain fart of what the games are. Sorry, it'll come back to me later, maybe. <laughs> All right, uh, I I have uh, I followed a recommendation at Dice Tower West. I had a few people come up to me and say, "Have you played Eons End yet?" And I, I hadn't, uh, but they, and they said, "This is my favorite what? cooperative deck builder. You need to try it." So I I found a copy in the library saddled it up and and went for a go um eons end is a cooperative deck builder from action phase and indie boards and cards it's uh designed by kevin riley the 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 trick uh with this you, you're playing mages uh that it's something like a breach mage in the mythology of this of this universe you've got a little board in front of you with the your powers listed of of what your your mage can do and then you have like four slots up on the top you start out with one of them open, uh, but the others can be opened by spending some of your resources in the game. And these allow you to store, like, spell cards that then can be triggered uh, in, in the future. And the other cool aspect, you're, you're trying to, you know, beat back a big bad, some sort of major bad guy that has a whole bunch of hit points, and you're trying to take him out while dealing with minions and, and calamity cards that show up. and uh, and just He's clearly bad. He might as well just be called bad guy. Bad guy. <laughs> it's, it's, it's Jeremy bad guy. Um, and, and another one of the mechanisms that is, is twisty and cool here is that you don't shuffle your deck. Uh, so as you are playing cards and discarding cards, adding cards to your deck, they are going into your discard pile in a specific order. And even when you discard your cards that you played at the end of the turn, you can arrange them however you want, and then you put them in your discard pile so that when you run out of cards in your draw pile, you simply flip over the discard pile. This allows you to cluster cards together that work well together and try and get those combos to work uh, more often than they would in a standard deck builder where you're shuffling and hoping that they come out in that order. Uh, I, I enjoyed this game. I, I, it has some tricky decisions as far as buying the cards versus opening up more of those slots. There's ways that you can spend resources to sort of make it easier for them. You sort of... Uh, these These... Breaches, they're called, have a cost, and you can spend some resources to twist them down so that they are now less expensive to trigger in the future. And when you do that, you can even put spells in those places temporarily. You have to use them on your next turn, but um, you can sort of, as if you had unlocked that breach slot, use it, um, which is neat. And uh, I, I, I enjoyed the building up of your character uh, to do cool stuff. You have special abilities that you can charge up. You have a certain number of charge slots, and when you fill that up, you can fire that off, which is very helpful in getting stuff done. Um, it has this... Now, we played one of the later standalone expansions, um, War Eternal, I think it's called, and it has a tutorial system. So you open the thing up, and it says, do not shuffle these cards, open up this pack, and just follow the instructions, and you'll be all set for your first game. This is all well and good, unless you are using a library copy in which that pack <laughs> has already been opened. 
Um, and the instructions did not have a full description of what was in that pack to begin with. Well, fine then. Just don't oh. play the tutorial. Uh, well, it looked like it. I knew what was in there to start. Like they had some illustrations that said, "Here's what the deck would look like." In this pack, and so I just dutifully got all those cards out and put them in a stack and and set things up, and thought I had it all ready to go, um, until somebody who knew the game came by and said, "What that stack looks way too small, yeah, you're gonna lose," <laughs> um, and it just I, I would have liked a a card manifest that said, "Are you setting up the tutorial again? Here's all the cards in that stack," and then I would have been fine. Um, but yes, we should have the just... The tutorial is amazing, by the way. It's a really handy way that that game teaches you it. it is it better than Fog of Love, would you say? I <clears throat> haven't played Fog of Love yet, so I don't know. What? What? <laughs> I only have so much time in a day. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't either. I'm in love, so I don't feel like testing it. Right? I'm, uh. I'm about to come up to my 20th anniversary. Why should I mess with the waters now? <laughs> Sh- shame on both of you guys. Shame. Uh. Oh, wait a minute. Let's talk about how many games we played in the last couple weeks. I'm, I'm, I'm up to like 20. <laughs> it just, All right, I'll take it back. Just none of them were Fog of Love. Anyway, I enjoyed <laughs> Eon's End. It was not, I was not jumping off the cliff and rushing to buy a copy. Um, but I did find it fascinating and a neat challenge. And I am kind of interested in exploring the legacy version. You just said you weren't jumping off a cliff now. You want to play the legacy version? I'd like, that doesn't, I... <laughs> I'd like to see how that all works. Maybe play You'll a never friend's finish copy. It. I probably wouldn't You'll finish. You'll never it. finish a leg- How many legacy games have you finished? Um, two. <laughs> How many have you started? Three. <laughs> okay, that's not too bad. Then you're yeah. You're, you're at a sixty-seven percent. That's that's not failing. Yeah, yeah. It, and Pandemic did the same thing for me. Where I'm not, not like super excited about Pandemic, but Pandemic Legacy was awesome. So I can see how he feels about that. Sure. I mean, I'd like oh, to try it. Point. But anyway, I enjoyed it. It's just it's just not an instant buy for me. Eon's end. All right, I don't I don't know if you guys have heard, but there's this small television show called Game of Thrones. It's in the final season. What? It starts sometime soon. I don't know. Some people might be interested in this. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, if I were them, I would have aired the finale of Game of Thrones on the same night as Endgame, just to see what happens. What's that <laughs> thing? Universe explode. <laughs> So, anyhow, there's some excitement. Uh, I think people like to see a show that has a clearly scripted end come mm. to an end. You know, because most shows kind of just peter out these days. Or never finish at all. Don't get me started. Um, anyhow, so I'm talking about a, a game called Game of Thrones Oathbreaker. Now, this is from the same design studio that did uh, Clank. So they're doing it in conjunction with Renegade Games. Mm. This is a social deduction game. You can actually watch us play this live. We played it last week. Uh, that was a paid uh, playthrough, so this is not. So I'm just going to tell you what I think of the game. Uh, in this game, each person is a character from Game of Thrones that gives you a special ability. However, one person is the king. They're not a character at all. You're just the king. It's up to you whether you want to be King Joffrey or King Robert or Tom, Tommen. And, or, there's a lot of kings in this story. Sure. It doesn't always end well. Um, so you can pick one of the kings. So you're the king. And several players at the table are, like, evil. They want they want to depose you. And several uh, – well, not several. A couple players are good. Maybe one, depending on how many players are in the game. Huh. So everyone is trying to accomplish missions. And the game is essentially play cards on these missions, shuffle the cards up, reveal them, see if you've completed the mission or not. The king then will give cards to the different players – that will give him points at the end of the game if he gives the good cards to the good players and bad cards to the bad players, but will lose him points if he does it the wrong way. Hmm. These cards can also affect the game and possibly give special powers or harmful effects to the players. The players can also do things and try to work with each other, and meanwhile, as in any of these games, accuse each other of being the bad guy the whole game. <laughs> the thing is, when you accuse someone of being the bad guy, you're probably right. There's a lot of them. It's an unusual game in that aspect because in most of these games, there's only – sometimes there's only one traitor, right? This has a lot. So you are – if you are the good player, and I think it's easier to be the good player, your whole focus is finding the other good player or more of them. If you are the bad player, you are just trying not to be 
caught. So you want to do good things, but you don't want to help the kingdom too much. But if you start doing bad things, the king can nail you and just score a lot of points that way. I would rank this as a good social deduction game. I thought the theme was good. I, I mean, you probably could play it without the Game of Thrones theme, but that's kind of fun, especially if you're into that theme. Mm-hmm. Uh, I like the... It feels like a very streamlined Battlestar Galactica, playing the cards on the different missions. And if there's one thing I'm not a big fan of about Battlestar Galactica, it's that the game's just a little long. The tension is there, but the game, you could figure out who people are early sometimes, and then the tension is gone, and it's more like... It's, it's more of just team first team. I mean, the game is team first team. And the fact that someone is the king kind of brings a new dynamic into the mix. I would say it is above average for the social deduction games. It might make my top ten of social deduction games. I have to sit down and make that list. And I liked it a lot. And if you're Game of Thrones, I think you'll be very, very happy with it. That's Game of Thrones Oathbreaker. Cool. Out of curiosity, it sounded like I was getting bang the dice game vibes out of that. Is that is it kind of similar to that? <sighs> Not. Yeah, maybe. You know, I didn't even think about it that way. Bang or bang the dice game. Yeah, you know, one person's the sheriff and then people are deputies or outlaws. It's, it is sort of that way, but the you're, there's, there's no elimination in this game. Even if you're out it, you can just say, all right, well, I'm just playing bad cards the rest of the game, hmm. obviously. But the king can, those cards that the king plays on players has a big swing at the end of the game. And you can lose if the king has figured everyone out. There's even a a six-point swing. At the end of the game, the king has to say who everybody is. And if they're correct, they get three points. If they're incorrect, they lose three points. Mm. There's a a good token and a bad token that will move up based on the missions. And so that six point swing could be the game. Wow. So it's not necessarily in your best interest to be like, I'm bad. <laughs> also, people look at you weirdly because that's a really weird way to act. <laughs> <laughs> not a very evil laugh. <laughs> so that's Game of Thrones Oathbreaker. And also, it doesn't contain any spoilers for the final season. But there's definitely possible spoilers for previous seasons. However, seriously, if you haven't watched them by now and you want to play this game... I don't know what to tell you. Yeah, <laughs> We've had this big discussion, like we were talking about six cents, and I was like, there, there comes a point where you can't get mad about spoilers. No, you can, Tom, you can. <laughs> I, hate, I hate that you brought up the six cents, because that got spoiled for me in the worst way. No, 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 watching- no, I'm not arguing that you can't spoil, but there comes a point where you go out and watch the thing, or suffer the consequences. But Tom, I got, okay, I got spoiled of the Sixth Sense ending by watching 51st Dates, which is a horrible Adam Sandler movie, and that's how it got spoiled to me. I dodged the spoiler for years. It was like a decade, <laughs> and it got ruined to me by 51st Dates. Yeah. But you could have watched it over that decade. Yeah, I could have, Tom, but I was busy watching other great movies. There's a lot of great movies out there. But, uh, I get that. I'm just saying I don't see why people get mad. It, I, I can't talk about anything anymore. I can't talk about board games or books or comics or <laughs> guess what? No, I was about to say something stupid. All right, never mind. <laughs> we were just discussing this on Dice Tower tonight, uh, just just a day ago for me, but uh, you know, last week. If you're listening to this right now, and, and and the the issue, I totally get what Gary's saying. That after a certain point, it becomes fair game and part of the cultural zeitgeist, and so it's it's fair game for SNL sketches or for you know, references in other movies and just regular discussion. In other things, it becomes okay to spoil the ending of the movie or, or pl- major plot points of a TV show. It just becomes part of everything. And so I feel like you, there's a certain period of time that you have to watch that movie or watch that TV show before those references are going to start to filter into the culture. And you aren't going to get any warning. You're, you just run into it and that's it. It's mostly just because it was a horrible Adam Sandler movie that did it. If it was anything else, I'd be, I'd be, I'd be perfectly fine. Yeah, but, but it was the, just because of that. The thing that gets me is okay. So I'll, I'll come in and we'll start talking about Avengers Endgame. Like, oh, I wonder what's going to happen. And somebody will sit there and go, "Oh, I haven't watched any of the other movies yet. Don't, don't, don't spoil me." Well, leave the room. <laughs> I mean, come on now, because there are people who say don't spoil me, but they literally are never going to end up watching this show. So you can't even talk about it around these people. Right. They're like, oh, well, someday I'm going to start watching, you know, uh, 
Breaking Bad or Walking Dead. We'll make that day today <laughs> or let us talk about it. Yes. One of the two. <laughs> Touche. But speaking also, of spoilers... That movie, that movie came out almost 20 years ago, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> But speaking of spoilers, uh, Jeff uh, has decided to spoil at least a minor plot point in a very popular video game. But wait, one thing first. That's award-winning podcaster. That is very true. We should congratulate Jeff and all of his various Ludology co-hosts, Gil, Mike, and Ryan Sturm, uh, on their Golden Geek Award for uh, for Ludology. It's well-deserved. I don't think Ryan should get it. He's been gone too long. Nice little golf clap for that. <laughs> Three, two, one, go. It's time for Game Tech with Jeff Engelstein, where we find out how games really work. In several Game Techs, I've talked about the game show Deal or No Deal. The simplicity of it makes it a great laboratory for examining human behavior. Now, for those few of you perhaps unfamiliar with the game, here is how it works. There are 26 briefcases, and each contain an amount of money ranging from a penny to a million dollars. The contestant selects one of the case, which is theirs, but it is not opened. Then they select a certain number of cases to be opened, and the amount of money in those is revealed. The player is hoping that the cases they select have low amounts of money in them for two reasons. First, the more low amounts that are opened, the higher the chance that their case has a high dollar value. Also, at set points, the mysterious banker offers them money in exchange for their case. If the player accepts the offer, the game ends. Now, in this game tech, I'd like to focus on one aspect of the game, the initial act the player makes, selecting the case. After the player selects a briefcase, it is brought down to the front of the stage and placed on a table next to the player under a spotlight. Why do this? Picking a case is not necessary for the mechanism of the game. It can very easily be designed so that the player does not make that initial selection. They just name number of cases to start opening, and then after a few, the banker makes an offer. Whether you pick a case at the start or just end up with a case after eliminating all the others makes no difference to the math of the situation. Well, the math may be the same, but the psychology of the two situations could not be more different. Once you pick a case and having sitting next to you, it's a totally different situation. It has value. It is tangible. It is yours. If you don't pick a case and just start opening some, there's no anchor point. The stakes seem much lower. And when the banker makes an offer, they're making an offer specifically to buy your case. That's the language that's used on the show. So it becomes a physical business proposition. If you didn't pick the case first, the banker would just be offering you money to leave the show. It feels much different. This is really a genius bit of game design. Having the player select a case first and physically moving it is such a simple thing, but it completely changes the feel of the game. That's your case now, and all your hopes and dreams are with that number, that shiny silver object. Psychologists have a term for this. It's called the endowment effect. When you own something, you give it a higher value than you would if it wasn't yours. In one classic experiment from 1984, participants were given either $2 or a lottery ticket, which was also valued at $2. Later, they were offered an opportunity to switch. Very few made the trade, even those that preferred express preference for the other item. This event has even been seen in chimpanzees, but only with food, not with other objects, which gives us some clue as to the origins of the psychology. A bird in the hand is worth two in the bush, but maybe even more if you need it to survive. Now, picking out a case to call your own is a great example of game design in Deal or No Deal. Another can be found in the computer game Portal. If you haven't played it, well, stop listening now, play it, and come back. Seriously. No, as you now know, Portal is a puzzle game where you're trying to pass through several test chambers to get to the exit. The chambers have various props, including cubes that you can use, for example, to keep buttons pressed. But in one test chamber, and only one, you are given a special companion cube, which looks just like the others, but has a heart on the sides, and you are told to carry it with you to the end of the level. This weighted companion cube will accompany you through the test chamber. Please take care of it. Did you hear that? Please take care of it. 
The game is specifically telling the players that they now own this and they are responsible for this inanimate object as a way of creating attachment. The companion cube, despite its short appearance in the game, became the breakout star. In interviews, the designers revealed that the companion cube was originally just a normal cube, and it kind of evolved out of necessity. Originally, the players kept forgetting it to carry it with them to the end of the level, and they had to backtrack and repeat the level over and over again. The designers decided to do whatever they could to make the player emotionally attached to the cube so they wouldn't forget about it. They added the hearts... And they added voice lines like this from the computer to make it seem more alive. The Enrichment Center reminds you that the weighted companion cube will never threaten to stab you and, in fact, cannot speak. And it worked too well. At the end of the level, the players needed to, well, part with the cube, and it is emotionally wrenching. Give players something at the start of the game, something that's uniquely theirs, whether it's a silver case with a number or a cube with hearts on the side. It will make them possessive and more emotionally invested and is a great tool for getting players committed to the play experience. This is Jeff Engelstein with Game Tech. So did I tell you that we discovered a way to kind of cheat at this game? Oh, did, uh, did you watch the same video I watched too? Well, apparently, if you... If you play it in the arcades, which we do all the time, because uh, me and my kids, we'd love playing this game. If you video the briefcases that are mixing up at the beginning and put it in slow motion, you can know exactly where the million dollar briefcase is. <laughs> now, I have to ask, have you actually ever done this? <laughs> <laughs> well, my kids did try it. I told them that this worked and it worked. <laughs> Definitely. We got the million dollar briefcase. <laughs> They did it. I did not see them do it, but they did it, and I saw the tickets pouring out of the machine. <laughs> the next time I was at the Gamma Trade Show, which was at Reno, and I came across the machine, I was like, hmm, oh, wait, I'm in a casino. <laughs> yep. Oh, yeah. Yep. And if I, I do this here, there's a good chance someone will club me. <laughs> <laughs> and I bet the casino scrambles it more than the arcade version. Well, here's the thing. First of all, it wasn't a casino. It was it was in a, the little arcade section at the casino, so it's still okay. tickets, right? The tickets are nothing. Uh, I have some moral quandaries, though. I told my kids not to do it again. <laughs> mm. You know, I wanted to see if it worked, but uh, it's that's that's cheating. I think. <laughs> I, I mean, it is. I don't know. I mean, it could go. You, you could get to a long debate on. Well, use the tools you're given. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I imagine those machines are going to either be updated or disappear from. Uh, from arcades very quickly. Oh, yeah. As, as well, word spreads. Here's the thing. Possibly, Eric, but at the same time, the way that these games and machines and things, carnivals, work is the fact that even if you won all the time, they'd still make money. Touche. Those, those tickets that you get out of a machine are worth less than a penny usually. Hmm. So let's say you win the grand prize of 150 tickets. That's a buck. You 50. get a cup. <laughs> yeah, it's, and that cup, you know, they didn't pay a buck fifty for it. And right. so, how much did you pay to play that game? Like a dollar. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, it, it, it's an interesting thing. But I, but you're right. I would, I would be fixing the machine and just say, oh, it's now it's completely random. Uh, flipping over to uh, to the Portal reference, and this is a great segment that has not only Deal or No Deal, but also references to Portal. I felt for that companion cube and did not want to walk. Walk it, uh, you know, get rid of it at the end of that level. Um, I, I sort of tried to find a way to save it, and no, you can't. <laughs> I still need to finish that game. You haven't finished Portal? Every single time I've touched the game, I would play it for like, uh, honestly, for like three, four hours in one sitting, and then I would never touch it again. It's happened at least uh, five times. <laughs> I haven't even started the game. It is. Both of them are fantastic games. Really, really good stuff. I got a higher score than Eric did on the pinball version, though. You, uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> I probably played it 500 times more. <laughs> <laughs> probably. I haven't played in years. Well, once again, congratulations to Ludology for winning that. Thank you, Jeff, for your contributions to the show. Over 600 episodes, and Jeff's been with us almost the whole time. Mm. So, alrighty, let's get to the most fun part. No, not wait. Almost the most fun part. <laughs> Mr. Uh, Mr. Mr. Uh, yes. Do you have any superpowers? Are you really working on nothing personal, Junior? What are your top ten 
candy bars. And now the Dice Tower will authoritatively, definitely, possibly, maybe, answer your questions. Uh, uh, Tom, uh, uh, which way to the bathroom? Daniel wants to complain about two-player variants. He says, I've been gaming for a while and have found one thing that irritates me more than most. When a game says that it is for two to four players or two to six players, when it really is a three-plus player game, and there is a special variant for two players, which vastly changes how the game is played. I tend to play a lot of two-player games because of a lack of players, and it can be frustrating. Uh, He says his wife and I went to a game day at our friendly neighborhood game store, and we got there a little late, so no one was available to play. I decided to look at some games in their extensive library and saw Bunny Kingdom which states it is for two or more players. We open the box and find that the rules for a two-player game are quite a bit different than the rules for a three-plus game. This has happened before with games like Millennium Blades and Blockus. It says two players on the box, but either you have to double up on pieces or you don't use some of the rules. Now, his question, do you think they should list this on the box? Should a game specifically designed for three or more players have a printed with a two-player variant or even the reverse, a two-to-four-player game with a six-plus-player variant printed on the box? What do you guys think? Should it, should it be listed in some sort of clear way that it's not the standard way to play on the side of the box? So you're saying, should they tell the truth? <laughs> <laughs> yes, more or less. I mean, they're already lying about time and age. I mean... They might as well not even put age on boxes at this point. Ah, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's true. I mean, from a stance of uh, just like should they actually morally, yeah. But from a marketing stance, no, <laughs> they should not. <laughs> <laughs> right? There's no way. <laughs> no, no one's gonna say. You know what you should do? You should try to sell fewer games. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. This is the sort of thing you need to go to Board Game Geek for, uh, where hobbyists are able to discuss this and put it out. I just can't see, even if there was some sort of way that you could, you know, put the number two in in orange and the others in a different color, and you know, s- some sort of method that made it clear that these were variants or outside the normal realm of the game. That's just confusing, and it's it's not going to be immediately evident that this is the case. Oh, you cannot pay a graphic uh, designer enough to figure that out. Yeah. I, I wonder, like, if this would be an interesting challenge if someone decided to actually do it, to make it clear that this was a variant or that the, the prime sweet spot is from three to four players, but it can also play with five or two. How do you convey that in some sort of simple way that, that would equal what it currently says on the side of the box? Um I, I don't just don't think it's possible. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I hate this as much too. When I if I play a game and it looks like it's for two players, and you're like, you want to play with a dummy player, and I hate dummy players. Um, but if you really want to play two player games and you're not sure, then buy a two player game. <laughs> However, happily, there are websites I could point you to a couple who specifically review games. And point these things out. Hmm. Hopefully. So that's what I would recommend. That you talk to them. By the way, Blocus works really well with two. I don't... I know you have to use double pieces, but that doesn't change the game. It just... It depends on how you feel about it. Right. You you each get two colors, right? Sure, but I don't think that's that big of a deal. Yeah. You could buy a two-player Blocus anyway. Yes. It's black and white, I believe. Well, our next question comes from Sam. What's the difference between an expansion and a promo? Are all promos regarded as expansions? If not, at what point does a promo equate or assimilate to an expansion? So basically he's asking about sets and subsets here. Hmm. You know what bothers me? <laughs> is uh, those, uh, but this those, is those expansions where it's an expansion, but it should have been a promo. <laughs> you ever run into those? <laughs> Oh, yeah. Um, Or the expansions in the box. Does that count as an expansion, or is it just a module that's in the box? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, that that is weird when there's a quote-unquote expansion in there. But if that's the first edition of the game, why why is that an expansion? Yeah, it's a variant, right? Right. Well, it's it's a very Kickstarter-y thing to do. Or Queen Games does this (laughs) extremely. I don't think they publish any games now. 
that don't have some mini expansion in the box. Hmm. Uh, well, a promo specifically is something that's done as a promotion. Either you're supporting Board Game Geek, Dice Tower, some website by getting the promo, or at a convention, you go there, and if you buy the game, if you pre-order the game from the company, it's a promo. Most promos are small. There's no outside packaging. They can't be sold in a store specifically. They don't have a UPC, I guess is how I would delineate that. Okay, yeah. That's a way better description than I had. I just had my definition of a promo was just like two cards. If it's something around the lights, <laughs> if it's something like two cards, it's a promo. And then it, then there's a promo pack, which could be eight of the same card, and then you get two expansions. <laughs> yeah. Here's the thing. I, I kind of count. I actually do differentiate them because with very few exceptions, I think promos... I, I shouldn't say with very few exceptions. There is no exception, I think, where a promo is necessary or I would say you need this promo. Hmm. I did a video just a few weeks ago, actually, on my top ten favorite promos. Number one spoiler was like Black Market for Dominion. Ah. But you do not need any of the promos, even on my top ten list, to enjoy those games. Oh. However, there are some games where I would say you really got to play with the expansion. Okay. You, you just wrote. Makes sense. There's, um, with, uh, what was the game, um, uh, Call of Cthulhu? No, not Call of Cthulhu. Oh, uh, Do Not Mess With Cthulhu. Um, that game, when it first was released, before it was the deluxe version, the promos actually made the game. I was actually really upset with that because uh, I actually had a friend that bought the game before the deluxe version came out. And he was like, oh, where are all the cool cards at? That was in the one that we just played. And I was like, oh, those are Kickstarter promos. You can only get them at conventions, too, at the time. But, yeah, hmm. so it was rough. Hmm. Gary, you want to take the next one? Uh, yeah, why not? Um, in a recent podcast, Richard Rado Ham was asked a question that I found interesting. And it would be fun to hear how you would answer said question. The premise is the old and overly used. You are stuck on an island and can only have pl- uh, have a few games with you forever and ever, yada, yada, yada. The intriguing aspect is that when, struck, uh, when stuck in this imaginary place, you may have with you either your top five games of all time or your top six through 20 games. Which would you choose? For comparison, after much painful deliberation and high-pitched howling, both Richard and Jennifer <laughs> chose to go quantity route and decide upon 6 through tw- uh, 20. Uh, thanks for your thoughts, Colin. Huh. This is a tough one. It is. Yeah, I'm actually pull- I'm pulling up my top 20 oh, right I, now. Oh, man. <laughs> I, will, I, will, I will know this. Hang on a second. Let me look here. This well, is my top 20 as of last year. Mm-hmm. Do, 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 do. I'm going to go... Oh, wow. Okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go with 6 through 20. That's a tough one. I almost picked 1 through 5 because number 3 is Gloomhaven. Hmm. So you got longevity. Uh, Yeah, that would be a while. Yeah. But number 5 is Escape Room Games, and those are one-time use. However, number 19 is Hero Skate, <laughs> and 18 is Arcadia Quest, so there's a lot of replayability there. So I think those kind of even out, and Seventh Continent's also in there. So yeah. when it comes to that, then I'm just going to go quantity. Well, I'd rather have 15 games than five. Plus, you with all that Hero Skate terrain, you could probably build a raft. <laughs> and it would float. <laughs> oh, man. I think, I think I'm going to go through one through uh, five, the top five. Is it top six or top five? It's top five, right? Top five. Yep, I think yeah. I'm going to go with top five because for me, that's uh, Code Names, uh, Secret Hitler, One Night Ultimate, Werewolf, Comet, and Risk Legacy. I hope you get stuck by yourself. <laughs> that's, that would be the biggest problem. <laughs> <laughs> You're not going to get stuck with a group of seven people. All right, I have all these social deduction games, just you and me, Bob. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, in in theory, when you get up to your top twenty games, you're you're talking about the cream of the crop. Even if it's not the top five, six through twenty should be solid games that you would be happy playing. And then you get fifteen games instead of five. But I don't know if I could give up the first five. I think that's my issue. I think I have to go with the one through five, and and end up with Alien Frontiers and Pandemic and Merchant of Venus. Yeah, yeah, I gotta go with one through five. Nick says, I've heard you say how much you dislike semi-co-op games. This is talking to Tom specifically. And uh, and feel like it's a broken system. 
But what is it about that system that bothers you so much? In particular, one of your top 100 games of all time is a semi-co-op, Marvel Legendary. What is it about that game that makes semi-co-op okay, but other semi-co-ops bad? Now, I, I'm going to write down what I think Tom is going to say. Hang on a second. Got it. <laughs> well, I think I said it before. That, the second part is really easy. The second part for Marvel Legendary is simply the fact that I don't play it as a semi-co-op. I just play it as a straight co-op. You can you play it as a co-op, and at the very end, you add up your points. Each individual person enters only one winner, I guess. I remember distinctly playing this with Eric when they first were playtesting it, right? We got to go to the upper deck booth and go behind the ribbon. Remember that? Oh, I remember that. And I had no idea. You just said, come over here now. I'm like, yes, sir. Sure, no problem. And, <laughs> and then we got introduced to this game. Right. And so they sat down and explained it. And I was like, why, why, do we, why is there just one winner? Why can't we just play it as a co-op? And they're like, well, you can. And I was like, yeah. all right, that's what we're doing. And I honestly, I don't know that I've met anyone who does play it as a semi-co-op co -op to the point where... Sam and my friend Matt, they went to, they played in a, a tournament one time at Origins, and it really threw them off because it did play it as a semi co op, and they had never played it that way before. Right. You, oh, well. you can sort of, some of the heroes, especially like Deadpool, plays specifically playing for points. And uh, that, that can be a little weird if you're not used to playing that way because you're, you're not going to make selfless acts and, and you're going to try and steal things out of people's score piles and stuff like that. Well, how do you play it, Eric? I, I play it as a co-op. Yeah, I, I ignore the... So, uh, you know, what I'll do is after we have won as a team, I'll say, all right, who gets the MVP award? It's sort of like you get the trophy back at headquarters. <laughs> it's, it, I, we totally underplay who wins. Yeah, there's a winner. There's a somebody gets the thumbs up or the employee of the month award at Shield. Um, but it, it's not like you won the game. We won. You get the thumbs up award. Gary, do you play the legendary game? Uh, I did for a little bit, and they just weren't for me. It just took way too long to do the setup and tear down, and th that just kind of got to me after a while. And then not only that, I think uh, uh, I actually tried playing with a few people that actually wanted to play it in a semi-co-op fashion, and that just really turned me off to the game, even though, yeah, I agree with you guys. It's definitely more of a co-op game. But, um, but yeah, it's uh, one of those games where it's just like, eh, to me. But, um, but I do understand that entire problem though like also uh, uh mysterium has that same exact issue as well where it's a uh technically a semi-co-op but it's not really <laughs> well here's the thing so why don't i like semi-co-op games i don't like them because inherently they are broken by human nature if there can only be one winner and i cannot be that winner there is no incentive for me to help everybody else win and so you can say, well, you shouldn't do that. Well, guess what? That takes a group of selfless people, and it doesn't make sense as a game. Why should I help you win? Right. We all hate king-making in games, and that's essentially what it is. If I'm going to come in last place, I'll go, well, you know what? I guess I'm just going to let the world blow up. I mean, <laughs> that way I come in last place, but so does everyone else. Yeah. And you can... I see that happen in every game of this. Someone's like, well, I'm not winning. Let's, it's worth the ship is going down. And I really dislike that. I, I don't mind competitive games. We'll go after each other. But then make it competitive. The only way I will accept the semi-co-op game is if there's some condition where everybody can lose over the course of the game. But you're all kind of trying to stop that. It's like in the background. Like, well, if nobody stops this virus from going everyone will lose or whatever it is right but cutthroat caverns does it okay there's a few other ones that do it okay but if, if you tell me a game is semi-co-op i am automatically dis, you know inclined to dislike the game <laughs> so I, I mean this is something that that's been discussed on ludology a, a good bit and I, I think on game tech as well the there there's it all depends on how you view the hierarchy of winning and losing. If you're in a semi-co-op, is the group winning but you not being the ultimate winner a better win than you coming in or than everyone losing? So do you view the group win as a better victory than everyone coming in at the same level losing? I do. I, I mean, I do, I do, I do, I have to, I, I'll go with, well, it was a semi. 
right. win for me. And so that's the way I see it, too. Uh, so I, I often am taken aback by the, if I'm not going to be the sole winner, I'm tanking this thing approach. But, it, yeah, if there's one winner, that is a valid way to play the game. Yeah, I just, pers- I just haven't personally been able to get semi-co-ops to work super well. I mean, outside of, like, social deduction games, which are... are would you even consider those semi-co-ops? No? I don't think so. But um, no. But for the most part, I haven't really been able to get semi co-ops really work well with in any situation. I've tried it with uh, uh, really competitive players that hate co-op games, so I figured that semi co-ops would work. Never could get them work uh, working in those situations, like uh, Dead of Winter and um, uh, a couple other games. But um, but yeah, semi co-ops. I don't know. They just on paper they seem like a great idea, but in practice, I've they just don't seem to really scratch that itch for me, and I haven't really been able to. Uh, have it scratch that itch for really anyone I've come across personally, but that's just me. All right, well, our last question is from Brant. He knows Vassal's Law is kind of tongue in cheek, so just real to reiterate, one day someone asked me to make up a law, and so I said Vassal's Law was if a game is truly excellent, it will eventually be reprinted. And yes, there's caveats. If, obviously, if you can't the IP, it won't happen, but I would say that this quote unquote law has been proven correct like 99% of the time. In fact, there was a geek list made on Board Game Geek where people said games that defy Vassal's Law. And many, many of those games have been reprinted since that geek list has gone <laughs> up. It's kind of counterproductive. It probably actually gave publishers a nice chunk of a list. Wow, <laughs> I don't know about that. I'm not. Uh, uh, but I, I felt a little smug. But anyhow, um, anyway, so he says, but it, it seems to hold true. Uh, do you think we've hit the saturation point, though, that will cause a game to not be reprinted, even though it's a good game, but just not selling well because there is so much out there? So is it possible that there are so many good games out there that a great game will get lost in a shuffle, not get a reprinting, and missing it the first time around will mean missing it totally? I think I would say that that's, that, 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 that's true, but I would say that the goalposts for what is a great game are moving. Hmm. That's the only thing I could say. Like, uh, for a game to be great, then it has to be even greater than it would have been uh, out there. But you know what? I'm still not seeing this happen. I would say Mississippi Queen was a very good game. It doesn't hold up against a lot of games today, and it's being reprinted this year. We're still seeing these games come back and back and be yeah. reprinted and be reprinted. I, I haven't seen the reprint wagon slow down yet you know i do sort of worry about what brant's talking about here though in that the marketplace is so crowded that even when a great game shows back up i wonder if the sales are there uh to to be seen amidst all these other brand new releases when you see um you know a, a, like uh stevenson's rocket i know you're not a fan tom but uh that was you know a great game of the past that has been reprinted how much notice did it get uh, showing up again when there are so many other games already in the market? Yeah, and I, I agree with you there. I think it's uh, going to be a hard sell. But at the same time, though, when you bring back a game that's been out of print, that's free buzz right there. I mean, a whole bunch of people are going to instantly find out about this uh, great game that people have been talking about for years. And all of a sudden, it's out. It's uh, it's, it's free press, <laughs> in, in other words. So, yeah, it's a really saturated market. But, I mean... In my opinion, I don't think it really takes too much to stand above the crowd. It's, uh, I mean, it's like if you bring back something where it's like, oh, this game used to be a top 10 game on BGG about five years ago. I think that's enough to get people looking into it. Speaking of which, how awesome is it that Bus is coming back? <laughs> oh, my goodness. How did you manage to get that into this episode? I deliberately didn't talk about it. Oh, man. And it was like the day we posted the episode, the, the announcement came out that Bus is coming back. That was so cool. The second I saw that. Well, let's hope they draw good artwork. <laughs> the cover looks they nice. Started, they started <laughs> playing it in my group the other day. And I looked over, and one of the guys who got suckered in looked like he was almost in tears. And I just smiled at him and, and played my fun game. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of smiling and laughing and chuckling and roaring and guffawing, let's go to our top ten. What about a chortle? <laughs> what is that? <laughs> it's a dice tower top ten! 
Dice Tower's Top 10 list is sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc. Cool Stuff, Inc. Cool Stuff, in stock at CoolStuffInc.com. Yes, I love games that make me laugh. I mean, that's one of the whole points of playing games is to laugh and have a good time. I've fallen out of my chair during games. I've doubled up. I've changed pants. I'm, I'm, so what I mean is I <laughs> laughed a lot in games. <laughs> TMI. TMI. Well, that's because it was the game lasted so long. I went in... Anyhow. <laughs> I... There's really no strong criteria. These are just games that make us laugh, right? Yeah. There's also clearly no strong uh, <laughs> criticism on what Tom says, too, as well. <laughs> uh, I believe... Well, here's the thing. <laughs> I'm not planning to mock anyone's list, I think. <laughs> I'm checking. Yeah, good. In fact, one of you, several games in your list were in my short list. Okay. All right. But which one? So I'm glad we have a guest this week. All <laughs> right. <laughs> Let's get started. Number 10. We're going to kick things off with a dexterity game from my childhood. It's called Pig Pong. This, uh, it has a plastic net with a sort of a, a paper ball, very light material ball that sits in the center of the net. And then you have these rubber pig air squeezer things, um, and the object is to squeeze air from these pigs to fling the ball over the side. And and the the idea is, is that you will be spraying and shooting the ball into the air, and it's going to float around, and, and there's going to be all sorts of time to do wonderful points and moves. What really happens is that you have this frantic squeezing of these pigs, and then the points last about 2.3 seconds. Squeeze, 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 and then it's over. Squeeze, 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 and it's over. And I have all these memories of my father and grandfather playing this game on Christmas morning. And just the look on their faces while they tried to play this game. I still laugh at Pig Pong, my number 10. I had that as a kid. Never heard of it. But uh, my number 10 is going to be uh, Spyfall. Spyfall is a social deduction game where uh, there's one person who's a spy and they don't know where everyone else is and everyone else knows where they are. And they're trying to ask questions to each other to try figuring out who is a spy among them that doesn't know where everyone else is at. It's a hilarious game, which it's one of those games that's so funny because pe- your people are not saying things so what's not being said is what makes the game so funny. You really have to experience it, but just the questions that go back and forth between um, who's a spy and not a spy, and uh, the game gets even more funny if the first person who's asking a question, uh, who's being answering a question, is a spy, and they have no idea what to say because they've gotten no clues so far. It's it's such a funny game. Um, I love it. Spyfall, my number 10. This was very, very high on my short list. I would say this is probably number 11. I really like Spyfall, and it is really funny. We play Spyfall super seriously, so it wasn't on my list. What? How can you play it serious? We're, we're very you serious. You can. It's, it's, it's disgusting. <laughs> my number 10 is Choose Your Own Adventure House of Danger, because I just get a kick out of how ridiculous this story gets. <laughs> when, you, when you start this Choose Your Own Adventure, you're going through, and you're like, okay, yeah, weird, interesting, okay. And then near the end of Chapter 1, something insane happens. I won't ruin that. Okay. And you're like, oh, this was – okay, this is crazy. Then in Chapter 2, it just – the craziness escalates, and they literally make it escalate in each chapter. Like, you're like, oh, this is about the max of the stupidity uh, that's going to happen in this game. Nope. They have more. Hmm. And I oh. laughed the whole time about how dumb this story was. But I liked it, but um, yes, it was dumb. Huh. I've only played through two chapters, so I, I'm curious to see where it goes from there. Sounds like Cabin in the Woods, the board game. Well, I don't. I would call <laughs> Cabin in the Woods a comedy. Um <laughs> borderline is <laughs> it's only a comedy if you think that sort of thing's funny i no uh, but i know what you're trying to say but th- th- this is just yes this is kind of over the top it's like a b movie you know at the beginning you're like just going through grounds and you see a few creepy things and then you you see something really strange and then you, in, in part two they start bringing in supernatural stuff and part three yada 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 it just gets pretty pretty over the top i thought so that's Choose Your Own Adventure, House of Danger. Number nine. My number nine is the worst game ever. That, 
but that's actually what it's called. A Worst Game Ever is a game from Guerrilla Games. It's a card game. This is one of those kind of like we didn't play test this at all that is really not a fantastic game. It's designed to be a ridiculous experience. Um, and each of the cards in Worst Game Ever has some sort of board game reference that, that twists the rules and does crazy stuff. There's one card, I think, that's called Misprint, and it's, it's printed off kilter. Uh, there's all sorts of references to specific games, to broken mechanisms, to just, it, this is a gamer's game that is also ridiculous and light and silly. And I, I think it works. I think this is a fun one to goof around with. Worst game ever, number nine. Okay. Um, my number nine is One Night Ultimate Werewolf. Ooh. Um, One Night Ultimate Werewolf, if you can't already tell, I love social deduction games. It's yet another one, uh, in which it basically takes the classic werewolf, uh, game and makes it over a short period of time, roughly about 10 minutes. Um, what happens is that one player is a werewolf or multiple players can be werewolves and the other people are talent folks and they're trying to figure out who the werewolf is among them. Um, One Night Ultimate Werewolf, it's one of those games in which, uh, when it comes to social deduction games, it's not that much, it's it's not that funny when you first start playing it, but as players understand who, what all the, all the roles are and all the situations are, and uh, you're just trying to lie and get clever with how you lie and stuff like that, the game gets hilarious in terms of the mental flips people do to try convincing you otherwise of things. But um, hmm. but yeah, that's my number nine, One Night Ultimate Werewolf. Yeah, this is also, this was probably my number 12. Really, Ooh. really like this. I, I would say if I had to pick one that's really funny, I might pick One Night Ultimate Alien, just because yes. some of the stuff in that one is is even more insane. Mm. Um, but the app kind of throws me. I'd prefer better voice acting. Wow. Um, <laughs> wow. I'm, well, I don't blame you. Well, I, 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 do you I want like the oddest? I know. I I like all of the you know the little. I have a very different perspective on the one night series uh, because I've I've just seen it as text primarily. Um, <laughs> you're tired of you're tired of reading the lines. But but I you know I enjoy the 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 humor that goes into the writing and and uh, the little interjections uh, that that get thrown in in later versions of the app. I'll just randomly say stuff. Um, which is fun. My favorite is uh, one night ultimate werewolf and the world's your oyster. Which is a very obscure <laughs> chess reference. I like it. Oh, you're I'm surprised right. you don't play that, that one. Is what that is? Huh. Yeah, uh, I didn't even get that. But yes, that's correct. He's talking about the musical. Yes. Um, but I think for you, probably you, it would be weird to play a game with your voice in it. But happily, in later versions, they had multiple voices, so you could just play with the opposite one. I could swap it out. Yeah, but you don't. You like to hear your own voice. <laughs> no, no. Yeah, I. I but but my kids. <laughs> <laughs> my kids don't want to play with the app. They don't want to hear me talking. So my son will play without the app, and he'll be the moderator and imitate me in the app. <laughs> I don't. I don't know how to interpret that. That seems like a psychiatrist should. <laughs> We're working through it. All right. My number nine is Sheriff of Nottingham because this game, especially when the players really get into character and just go back and forth and argue about how literally there's only three cheese in that bag. I swear there's only three cheese in that bag. And then you start making stories. The person, the sheriff threatens to open it. You start bribing him. It's ridiculous stuff gets said. This one is very group dependent. I think you could play this one pretty straight if you wanted to. But if you role play even a little bit, this game turns into some great hilarity, especially when someone just lies right through their teeth who you expect it was an honest person and is an honest person in real life. And in Sheriff of Nottingham, I don't know what happened to their morals. <laughs> so that's no, I agree. That's my number nine, Sheriff of Nottingham. It, I've yeah. I've had some very funny sessions of this. Yes. Yeah, I agree. People do have to role play to play that one. It's uh, it could get really funny. Number eight. Number eight is Ugtecht, or the original Argtecht uh, in German. This is which a- name do you like better? I like Argtecht better because it sounds like architect. I don't know what Ugtecht is supposed to be. Well, that's you need to increase your vocabulary. <laughs> I, anyway, uh, Ugtecht <laughs> is a game about getting your teammates to position blocks in a particular pattern, but you have to speak only in caveman language. Uh, and when they make a mistake, you get to hit them over the head with an inflatable club. That's my number eight, Ugtecht. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, that's that, that that does describe it in a nutshell. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what else to say. It's, it's <laughs> Eric is correct. <laughs> Um, my number eight is Resistance, and yes, this is going to be the last, I promise, the last Solstice Deduction game I mentioned in this list, but um, the thing I like about Resistance that's ranked it better than when I Ultimate Werewolf and Spyfall when it comes to being funny is, is that um, I've just had, I guess you could say, more enjoyable times with Resistance, like, uh, I guess you could say, I had better individual funny moments with resistance um because with resistance i tend to play in larger groups than when i ultimate werewolf and spyfall so it just allows for those situations where you have a room full of like eight nine people and uh just something hilarious happens in terms of the deduction but resistance very similar to all the other ones um there's two teams bad guys good guys and uh the bad guys are trying to fail the missions once they fail three missions they uh win the game good guys are trying to pass the missions it's pretty straightforward but that's uh my number eight resistance Resistance was also one I considered. Okay. Uh, my number eight <laughs> is Galaxy Trucker. Hmm. And I know some people have very different opinions of this because they don't find the game to be funny at all. But I just find it amusing as your ships get destroyed by random meteorites. I don't know why this amuses me so much. You would think it would get old after a while. It doesn't. I don't <laughs> care if it's my ship. But it is funnier when it's yours. Uh I don't know what there is. It just cracks me up. As you watch it, the meter comes in, hits that one spot, and whole big chunks of your ship fall off. It just makes me laugh. Number eight, Galaxy Trucker. It's one I haven't played somehow. Oh, Oh, somehow. You would like it, I think. I I, I feel like I would, too. (laughs) Number seven. Number seven is a bit of an obscure game these days. It's called Familian Banda. Uh, There's no English name to it. Yeah. Um, It's a game that you're building a giant family tree. uh, And you're arranging marriages and getting a particular genetic trait, like big noses or, or poor eyesight, and trying to work that into the bottom layers of the tree... Um, where they will earn points. And uh, so you, you play cards that act as kids for a particular match uh, and arranging marriages. But the way that we have traditionally played it, we will it's like it's a high society game. We will announce the marriages. Uh, well, ladies and gentlemen, we would like to announce the marriage of, of the Duchess of Flurfington and the Duke of Schnoz. And, and, so these, and it's these... <laughs> caricature illustrations which are silly to begin with but when you start really playing it up and and just uh you know coming up with these silly names it it's the way we happen to do it and it's quite fun familian banda my number seven um my number seven is unusual suspects um unusual unusual suspects is a game a party game essentially where um i i'm not going to sh- beat around the bush i basically call it races of the game but essentially what you're doing in the game is, is that um, uh, essentially one person knows of a suspect and the rest of the group is trying to figure out who that suspect is by answering a uh, array of questions and um, these questions are basically just very prejudiced questions it's just like uh does this person um uh believe in uh like believe in spacemen or something like that or does this person uh brush their teeth and you just have to look at these pictures and just do your best at uh, what do you think that person who saw the suspect, what do you think their prejudice of that person is? Um, it's a hilarious game. This game can go south very fast. Mm. But if you're with the right group, this game is a hilarious game. And um, in my in my opinion, I actually use this game to actually get comfortable with people. Because it's just like, hey, let's just have fun and just joke around and stuff like that. And in my book... Most things are jokes in my life, so <laughs> that's uh, number seven, Unusual Suspects. Yeah, I like the game. It just uh, – racism, you could say – I, I wouldn't even just call it like judging by outward appearances. Like yeah. if there might <laughs> be a bunch of people there and you'll say like, which one of these works out? And you're like, well, obviously not that guy. <laughs> you know, yeah. But maybe he does. I don't know. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. It just – uh, I, I talked to some people that they're like, yeah, my, I, I played as my family and I, I couldn't even talk to them for a day afterwards. You know? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I worry about this one. This is the one I, I get uncomfortable playing this game. <laughs> I could totally see that. My number seven is Meeple Circus. Mm. This is a silly dexterity game where you are basically building a little circus act with little animals and sticks and meeples and... As the game goes by, 
there's circus music playing while you're building these acts. You have, sometimes you have to do silly things, and there is a lot of laughter. It's really a fun game. Uh, we have a mega version of it at the Dice Tower Library, which is even better because the pieces are bigger. Uh, I don't know what it is about this game that makes it funnier than other stacking games, but it just works really well. Meeple Circus. Well, I think it's those actions in that final round, the performance round, when you're forced to do specific things like stand up and, and bow or or pretend to eat a sandwich for 30 seconds, um, that that really <laughs> it, it, it plays up the silliness of this game. And this is one I missed. I probably would have put this on the list if I had if I had considered it as a hilarious game. I agree with you there, Eric. I probably would have, too, as well. Number six. Number six is But Wait, There's More. This is a party game about selling items uh, and your opponents causing you to uh, to have to add more to the sales pitch as you go. I'd like to uh, jump in here and say this is also my number six. Yes, I, I didn't know if you wanted to, like, reveal at a specific point and say, But Wait, There's More about But Wait, There's More. But, <laughs> but that that's fine. You can just jump in now Missed if you want. Yeah. <laughs> Here, well, you want to start over? <laughs> <laughs> and that's not all. <laughs> so why is it on your list, Tom? Oh, well, same thing. I, I Actually, this is one of the few games in existence where I almost always want to play with the expansion, and that's not all it's called. Mm. Because this, there's a lot of these games where you need to sell stuff, you know, and there's I could probably make a top ten list of these selling games. This yeah, is my, true. easily my favorite because... You all, you do your pitch, and then you have to flip a card, and that card suddenly changes what you're saying. And that's why I like the, and that's not all, because then you flip another card. Mm. And it's just, it's really funny, some of the stuff that can come out from this one. Yeah. I played this one, and we really enjoyed it, but for some odd reason, it never came back out again. I don't know why. Because you keep playing bring it out. Land, Air, and Sea. <laughs> <laughs> or, or one of the next games I'm about to talk about, um, except for this one. No, I don't play this one that much. But my number six is Fog of Love. Um, if Fog of Love is basically a, uh, it's basically a romantic comedy, the board game. Um, you have two players sit down and they basically reenact um, various different scenarios depending on which way you set it up of doing a basically a relationship. And um, the things that you go on through that game are hilarious. It's a it's it's not one of those like, it's one of those games in which if you play by the mechanics you're going to have a horrible time it's not funny it's going to be a dull game if you just read off the card and just that's it it's going to be dull but if you role play the game hilarious game this is a this game if you want to start like working on your improv a little bit this is a great game to go back and forth with someone on but um hmm. that's my number 6 fog of love doesn't the danger increase if you if you really role play it? Uh, you know, Tom was sort of joking that he he didn't want to ruin a relationship by playing this with a significant other. If you start role playing I, too much, doesn't that increase the danger? I personally have never played it with a significant other, but I I don't know. I can't see that as being a problem because one, you're supposed to be acting as someone else. You're not acting as yourself. Yeah. If you are acting as yourself, then that may create a problem. Maybe, but you're not. You're not supposed to. So that's where that's where I find it. I think it'll be hard. I don't know. I'll try it out sometime and I'll report back to you guys okay. if I uh, break up. <laughs> okay. Oh, thanks. No, I'm actually kidding about that. I, I, I. That's just my fake reason for not playing it. it just hasn't got to the table but <laughs> yeah. yeah number five so my number five is a haba game called dancing eggs also known as Irotons. and it looks like tom you've put a note here that it's also called crazy eggs as of 2018 yeah, i just i just got the latest version of s and it's called crazy eggs now but it's okay. the same game all right uh this Actually, is it's not the same game but i'll tell you in a second Oh, sure. Well, the, the version I know is Dancing Eggs or Irotons, and it involves, it's a kid's game uh, in which you're trying to collect eggs, most of which are these foam rubber sort of bouncy eggs. And uh, you've got a couple of pair, uh, dice that one tells you how you will acquire the eggs. Sometimes you have to yell something. Sometimes you have to stay quiet. Sometimes you take these bouncy eggs and drop them, and whoever catches them gets the egg. Um, and, and then it tells you where you're supposed to put the egg, and so you have to then, like, store the eggs on your body, like in the crook of your elbow or on your shoulder and your neck or under your arm or even between your legs, which can cause issues when um, one of the ways to earn an egg is to run around the table. 
So you might have to stand up and run around the table with an egg held between your legs, which is hilarious.、Um, and once an egg gets dropped, that ends the game, and you count up how many eggs you've got.、Uh, it's designed for kids, but it is also pretty funny to watch adults play dancing eggs. My number five. Yeah, real quick. The crazy eggs. The difference is, is that you know, in the original one, there was a wooden egg. Yes. That is now a rubber egg, just like the normal eggs and dancing eggs, and the and the the rubber eggs are replaced by hollow rubber eggs. Huh. huh. <laughs> They don't bounce around as much, but I don't think it. They're a little easier to hold when you're squishing one in your armpit. Yeah. Okay. But um, yeah, I've been wanting to play that one for a long time. I've been seeing it at the portal, and I just cannot get the courage to pull it out. <laughs> <laughs> you got to make sure you've got room around the table if you're going to play it, because if you have to run、That's、around、right. it, you don't want to be, you know, knocking over chairs. Yeah.、Um, but yeah, num- my number five、uh, is actually up on other people's lists, so we'll dash up to it later on. My number five is probably on someone else's list, but I bet they changed the name. Hmm. Number four. Number four.、Uh, when we first looked at this game, I thought it was ridiculous and that it was never going to work. But reverse charades provide some very entertaining situations.、Um, the, the The concept is that instead of having one person act things out and the entire group guess, you have one person guessing and the entire group acting things out. And where the funny the the, the funny comes from. Is is that the group is not allowed to discuss how they're going to act anything out? So a a word comes up like roller coaster, and three of the four people acting things out might pretend that they're on the roller coaster while the the other one is waiting in line and and has not organized <laughs> this. And so now you know which which person is the guesser paying attention to,、um, and that confusion and ridiculousness is where a lot of the hilarity comes from in reverse charades. My number four. Man, do you remember that one reverse charades we did at、uh, the portal? And the one team of people who were larger than myself <laughs> doing some pregnancy. Things <laughs> that has been seared in my brain forever.、Uh, I I just remember one where one of the players looked like they were going to lose their pants. That was the same game. <laughs> okay,、yes. I think that was at Total Con, but yes. Oh, did I say what did I say? You said the portal.、Uh, portal. I meant Total Con.、Yes. Yeah. Yes, I I do remember this. Oh, I was getting ready to get rid of this game soon, guys, and you guys just convinced me to keep it. <laughs> I haven't played it yet. <laughs> But、um, my number four is Fun Employed.、Um, this is basically a game that mimics Cards Against Humanity almost, except、uh, instead of you being told what to say and what's supposed to be funny, you actually get to do improv and joke about it.、Um, so basically, how it works is that、uh, one person is hiring people, and everyone else gets these trait cards in which they have to use in their、um, spiel to convince that person as to why they should hire them.、Um, And of course, you get really random cards.、Um, and the game's hilarious. It's it's one of those games where, with the right group, this game is funny every single time you bring it to the table. If you have funny people that are good at making up jokes on the spot, great time.、Um, yeah, that's、uh, my number four. Fun employed. My number four is higher on Eric's list, but mine is better than his. <laughs> number three. My number three is higher on Tom's list, but by the time Tom gets to talk about it, he'll only be able to use one word. Ah. <laughs> And my number three is going to be Code Names.、Uh, Code Names is a game in which、uh, there's two teams, and one、uh, there's one person on each team that's trying to tell their team. Uh, what words are on a board by only using a one word, one number clue?、Um, it's hill. It sounds like it wouldn't be a funny game, but when you play it, and especially this is actually one of those games in which it actually works and it's hilarious with very competitive people.、Um, this is one of those games which you just see the room light up after a round of people playing it, and they just start yelling at each other for other people being idiots with their clues and their guesses and stuff. It's a really funny game. If you can find that group of people that just love to、uh, trash on each other, in my opinion, but、um, that's number three. Code names. My number three is Tales of Arabian Nights, and I thought for sure this would be on Eric's list. 
it, it, it was on the list uh, a few years ago. When we, I think it's been five years since we did a silly games list. It was there then. It's just sort of dropped a little bit. Yeah, it's just this game makes me laugh every time. There are better choose-your-own-adventure-style games. There are better, you know, pick-a-choice-and-go-with-them games. But Tales of Arabian Nights is so ridiculous. You know, you will meet somebody, a beggar, on the street, and you will try to be kind, and he'll rob you, and then you'll then run from this person and find a, a woman who then decides she's going to marry you and chase you across. And when you decide not to, you get arrested and thrown in prison. And, oh, and, then, and then you drink from the spring and now you're a woman and it's, it's crazy. It's insane. <laughs> and what's insane is the negative things. Like halfway through, I will, have, I will be crippled, um, crazy, uh, like delusional, like so many negative things. And it's funny. Probably in real life, I'd be more depressed about some of that stuff. <laughs> it is. I've and had fact, some very, very funny sessions with this game. So that's my number three, Tales of Arabian Nights. Number two. Number two was on Tom's list, and that's Telestrations. Uh, this one has uh, twisted a little bit. Of course, it's the game of telephone, but using drawings. Um, as I've mentioned a few times on the podcast, the last few times we've played Telestrations, it has been a very different experience because there are now the children playing this game as well. And um, the way they interpret things, it is, it is quite the speed bump when a phrase um, that may be unfamiliar to a 10 or 11 year old reaches them and they try and draw it. It, I will never forget house sitter. Um, it once it got into my son's hands. Anyway, uh, very, very funny <laughs> as you go through everyone's... I mean, the best part is after you get through the whole round and then you get to describe how these drawings have, have evolved and phrases have evolved and just flipping through everybody's books. The more the merrier with this game and, uh, and, and just don't worry about points. It is just a hilarious experience. Telestrations, my number two. Yeah, this was my number five. It is so funny. Um, I don't, I don't know anybody who tries to play this as a game. It's just an activity. It's just, you know, you're just playing to see this, the stupid stuff that happens. I insist when we play it that you try to be as accurate as possible. So don't just write cat or dog, write cat that's angry or whatever, you know, that you can, if, if you describe it a little bit, it makes the game better because each picture will get progressively crazier. <laughs> Yeah, I probably would have added this one to my list, except I actually haven't played this one in a really long time. I need to bring it out. Hmm. But I bet you have played something that is not a game. That is true. Wait, are you serious? Are you really talking about my number two? Which my number two is News at 11. That's not even is a, that remotely a game. It's not a game at all. What? It's just an activity. What? There's not even... How do you win? Oh, you don't always have to win, Tom. For it to <laughs> it's be not always about winning. Quote, no, that's what I'm saying. I'm not saying it's bad. I'm just saying it's not a game. All right, touche, touche. But um, News at 11 is basically Anchorman the movie, the board game. Um, you are essentially <laughs> getting um, these uh, uh, cards in which you have to fill out one little part of it. Like, it might say something along the lines of, like, um, uh, this this caused traffic today, and you have to fill in what that thing is. Um, and then over the course of rounds, because you're going from morning news to afternoon news to night news... Um, Everyone has to give a spiel on whatever that thing was that that was on their card. And then you get more cards. And then you have to also revolve the story around what other people said throughout the entire day. It gets ridiculous by the end of it. But um, in my opinion, News at 11 is a hilarious game. And I feel like it would be one of those uh, games that would translate very well to a TV show, in my opinion. It's, it basically is, essentially, anyways. But um, that's my number two, News at 11, which is a game. <laughs> look, look. I don't want to criticize our guest because I've never done that before. But hmm. <laughs> sure, I just this is this. You know, you talk about playing with the right people. This is so specifically playing with the right people. You a hundred percent need to find a group of people because you're only making each other laugh. There's like no audience. It feels like the game should be played for an audience. Hmm. hmm. Yes, I agree. I've actually been very lucky that every group I've played this game with has been hilarious so far. So I've been very fortunate there. I, I actually own two copies of this. I've got the original release from 
three, four years ago, and my son just won in a play to win the new uh, current edition of the game. Um, but I have yet to actually do it with a full group. Uh, it, it, it seems more like an improv activity than a game. I have to agree with Tom on this one, although I do want to try it and, and give it a whirl because it does sound like a blast. All right, my number two is one of the kings of party games that make people laugh. Time's up. I laugh every game. I've never played a game of this and not laughed. I have played games of this where I also yelled. Um, <laughs> but just there's always somebody in this game that does such a ridiculous clue that has nothing to do with the person, and then that clue is tied to that person forever. Mm-hmm. So much fun. If you've never played Time's Up, get it. Get Time's Up title recall. Get Time's Up whatever. It's hilarious. That's my number two, and I believe it was Eric's number three. Uh, yes, it was. And, and I mean, it, the you nailed it, Tom. It's the evolution of a particular session. You know, it starts out pretty straightforward, and you're trying to be as accurate as possible, but then you hit a clue that nobody understands or that, that whoever's giving the clue doesn't really get it, so they have to do the best they can. And that becomes the the meme, the the running gag that that goes throughout the entire uh, game session because that is more memorable and easy to guess than whatever the actual definition or or action of the person would be. Um, but it's all about that session, that shared experience of creating these clues and what works for the team members. And finally, number one. Number one is the silliness that is Magical Athlete. Um, all these crazy powers and how they integrate and, and come together that ultimately is just a roll and move game. But it's not just a roll and move game because these characters interact and they they trigger each other's abilities and then somebody leapfrogs over someone else and moves backward and forward and we've had rounds that seem like they're going to end but then they continue and and it's we had probably the loudest session that I've experienced at a total con event um, that I just could not believe how ridiculous it ended up being um, very very funny sessions of magical athlete my number one I don't think we're going to do another live version of Magical Athlete again. Um, we <laughs> well, that's because that. somebody thought it would be funny to give everyone pool noodles. <laughs> it was funny for like a minute. Um, but yes, I really, when I first saw this game, I said, this is, I can't believe this was even published. Now I'm like, I can't believe this was published. It's so stupid. And <laughs> it's out of print. I'm still working on finding someone to reprint this. But I do love this game a lot. It was my number four, Magical Athlete. Uh, this one would have been on my list if I remembered about it. This game shouldn't be funny. It shouldn't be fun. <laughs> but it is. It really is. Uh, my number one is uh, Monikers, which is actually... Also, Time's Up. <laughs> yeah, it's basically the exact same game. Actually, it is the exact same game as Time's Up. The only difference with Monikers is, is that Monikers is actually full of memes. In my opinion, it's full of way more random things. And uh, the best part about it is, is that if you don't know what it is, they have a description of everything written on the cards themselves. So you can actually just read it off, even though it takes away from the fun. But you at least don't get stuck as easily as it times up, in my opinion. But um, Monikers, it's a hilarious game. It's that game in which um, I think if I was to redo my top 100 now, I think it would actually would have replaced Codenames as my number one. Actually, I played. Wow. I play this game maybe every other week. I'm not even exaggerating. I play it that often. Mm. But um, but yeah, Monikers, number one. It's hilarious. My number one was Gary's number five, and that is Boulder Dash. I used to just say Beyond Boulder Dash, but it's pretty much the same game now. It is... I love the categories. Movies is still my favorite, but I do like the new category they've added in the last decade of Stupid Laws. Boulder Dash works well as a game for about three rounds and then after that people stop trying to win or at least if you're playing with a fun group and then you just you're proud of the stupid answers you wrote it's it, and then it gets metagamey right like an answer that will they'll start referring to answers that were given in previous rounds clearly like you know if, if we were doing something like and a word was gubacha and i might be like that's what gary Pope's shirts are called. You know, obviously not in the game. <laughs> and yet, people might vote for it because it was funny. <laughs> Baller Dash leads to stupidity, but I don't care because the stupidity 
happens naturally, unlike a lot of games where it's kind of forced upon you. And uh, this is a game that, I don't know how long Baldur's has been out, like 30 years now or something? Hmm. And it still holds up really well. My number one. That's, yeah, Balderdash is hilarious. I, I've, uh, Balderdash is probably has the funniest moments I've had in gaming, while Monikers is more consistent. But Balderdash, I love that game as well. It's hmm. hilarious every single time I play it. And Tom, that's two lists in a row for Balderdash, because it was on your B list two weeks ago. That's right. I did feel like I just talked about it. Well, it won't be on the C list. Be like the complete, a complete Boulder Dash, <laughs> competitive Boulder Dash, <laughs> competitive. There is no such thing. All right, folks. Championship some, Boulder Dash. <laughs> due to some sort of internet glitch, I can't access for our show the People's Choice, but they're on our website. If you always want to see our top ten list, you can go to the website and find them. So when this gets posted there, you'll be able to see it. Hey, that's it. We're at the end of the show. I need to jump in a car and go on a business trip. Eric Ooh. and Gary, thanks. Gary, thanks for stopping by. If people want to see more of you on the internet or hear more of you, how would they do so? Um, I guess the best way to do that would be to find me on Twitter at official late to the table. Um, you can also just feel free to message me on Facebook. My uh, name on that is just Gary Gare Bear Pope. I'm never changing that. And um, uh, I guess if anything recently is going on with me, it's just that uh, I'm looking into advertising for board game companies. So feel free to reach out to me if you're interested. But yeah, that's basically all I got going on for me right now. All righty. Well, that's it for the end of this, folks. I appreciate you coming and listening to us again. And until next time, I'm Tom Vassell. I'm Eric Summer. And I'm Gary Pope. And you've been listening to The Dice Tower. Thanks for listening. Promotional consideration has been provided by game publishers in the form of review copies of games. This episode number 601 was recorded on April 4th, 2019. Mandy and Suzanne join you next week, and in two weeks, C is for more than just cookie, as we present our top ten games that start with C. This podcast is sponsored by listeners like you. Thank you for your continued support. And speaking of support, the Jack Vassell Memorial Fund is dedicated to providing support to members of the board gaming community in their hour of need. If a catastrophic event has become more than you can handle, find out how we can help at jackvassell.org. The Dice Tower is produced by Tom, Mandy, Suzanne, and Eric, with assistance from Rob Searing and Roy Kennedy. Weaponized Japanese clothing provided by Gung Kimono. Timothy Pinkham composed our theme, and hosting is provided by Cool Stuff, Inc., where you can find great games at great prices at CoolStuffInc.com. Let us know what you think of the show by posting to the Dice Tower Guild at BoardGameGeek.com, following the Dice Tower on Twitter, or by emailing us at DiceTower at gmail.com. And don't forget to visit the other shows in the Dice Tower Network, including Four Corners of the Board, Boards and Swords, The Game Pit, The Party Game Cast featuring The Party Game Cast, Board Games Insider, Flip Flory's Super Saturday Board Game Serial, All the Bits, and Dice Tower Tonight. Find out more at DiceTowerNetwork.com. Until next time, from all the gang at the Dice Tower, have fun gaming. So talking about the Friends theme song, do you clap every time you hear it? Because I can't not <laughs> clap. I always have... I have to do it. Even if I'm driving. Just... I do too. And I'm, I'm much happier with the intro and later seasons where they clap in the clip during that time. Wait, it, it wasn't a part of it at one point? Well, no. The, it, no, the clapping yeah. was part of the song. Like, So if you watch seasons one or two, there's no clapping. They didn't. They didn't... Clap, I guess, in the series up to that point. <laughs> they added it in. I don't think it's in every intro. I'm, 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 I know it's not because the clapping is my favorite part. Right. They, they found clips from the show where there was clapping or slapping or some sort of percussive action. Um, it was just part of the, the music before that. Oh. And now you know. <laughs> and knowing's half the battle. G.I. Joe! <laughs> <laughs>